Hi everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Rukmini Banerjee and I am one of your three Athenaeum fellows for the year. We associate data science with the typical buzzwords, machine learning, statistics, programming, etc. We think of the technical skills, but forget about arguably its more important aspect, a critical mindset, something that is necessitated by any kind of scientific inquiry. Scientific inquiry is ultimately what data science seeks to do. It helps us analyze data to answer questions about the world around us. Data science is used in almost every field. Healthcare, advertising, fraud detection, navigation are just a few applications of its immense potential. To enlighten us about the importance of the critical mindset in data science, we have with us today Jay Cordes. Jay Cordes is a data science whose research focuses on mathematical modeling and applications of probability. He is the co-author of two books. His most recent book, published in 2020, is The Phantom Pattern Problem, The Mirage of Big Data. The book seeks to identify how we can overcome our inherited tendencies of recognizing patterns in the age of abstract and complex data. Jay is a Claremont College alum, earning a BA in mathematics from Pomona College, as well as a Master of Information in Data Science from UC Berkeley. His first profitable application of data science was the development of a simple online poker strategy that turned an initial investment of $50 into over 30,000. To Jay, right? Like, ooh. <laughs> um, today, Jay Cordes will speak about how integral critical thinking and the scientific mindset are when interpreting data and conducting analyses. During this talk, Jay will reference his 2019 book, The Nine Pitfalls of Data Science, which won the 2020 Prose Award in the category of Popular Science and Popular Mathematics. This event was originally scheduled in April 2nd, 2020, but had to be postponed in light of the pandemic. Before we get started, a few quick reminders. Please take this time to silence and put away your cell phones. We have an amazing speaker today. Be present and get ready to ask some good questions. And as usual, video and audio recording by the audience is strictly prohibited. Per college policy, it is always recommended to wear a mask when not actively eating or drinking. Welcome to the Athenaeum. The science begin. Hey everybody, thanks for coming out. Super excited. Um, so it's not a coincidence that my books look a little bit like warning signs because there's a problem. Okay? And the problem is not that I went to Pomona College, okay? I know, <laughs> I know CMC and Pomona are rivals. You wanna hold that against me, that's fair. I don't wanna hear that Pomona your mama stuff you used to yell at the basketball games, okay? You guys still do that? No? Yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, it's catchy, right? But you don't wanna say that to me because Pomona my mama, Pomona my mama wrote your school song. <laughs> and she can change it, okay? She's gonna see this talk, and if you guys start heckling me, you might just find yourself singing about sage hens at your graduation, okay? Now, the real problem is that data science students are often extremely technical with computation and statistics, but they can't really critically solve problems with data, okay? And I think the solution to that is to center data science education around the scientific method or scientific reasoning, okay? Uh, Dr. Julia Koshinsky, by the way, she is a force of nature, and I am happy to be jumping on her coattails, and she is developing a website uh, with this in mind. Here's a sneak preview. It's, uh, it's not out yet, we're just working on it. Um, basically it has three goals, okay? It's gonna raise awareness of this problem that data science students have a lot of the technical skills but not the core skills. Second thing is it's gonna collect a lot of educational materials, videos, blogs, and things like that, and it's gonna package them as teaching modules that educators can incorporate into their own courses. And the third thing is just to kind of get a community of people together, like myself, I think this is important. We're gonna to try to come up with new educational ideas and actually validate that they work, okay? And this is important stuff, guys. You look at your promotional material, uh, interpreting and analyzing data is gonna be the center of it all. So how do you know science works? can deflect asteroids, right? Neil deGrasse Tyson likes to say the universe is trying to kill you, 
you know. And it seems more true now than ever, right? So now I'm going to blank out. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> so Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to tell us that this works. And one of the things that scientists are terrible about is kind of self-promotion. So I actually want to tell you a little bit about the crazy stuff that scientists are working on, OK? This is Super K. This is a neutrino detector. It's under a mountain in Japan. This thing detects neutrinos because they go through water faster than light, make little sonic booms of light. And this thing is detecting those. LIGO, this thing is looking for gravity waves. This thing is measuring ripples in space time, right? Another crazy thing that Einstein predicted. And these guys are popping up all over the place. These are nuclear fusion reactors. Um, we want these to work because this is kind of limitless clean energy, okay? It's taken a couple years to get it done. Look for it. It's coming. Um, the reason it's taken a little while, you kind of have to make a synthetic star. And since it vaporizes everything it touches, you got to levitate it in a massive magnetic field. Science is doing crazy stuff, and it works. So what is this mindset that I think that data science need to learn about? Well, I think the golden rule is you got to learn how to not fool yourself and do whatever it takes. So I heard a story a couple weeks ago I'd never heard before. Um, there was this French scientist who discovered N-rays. Never heard of N-rays. I'm like, what's that? OK, some people couldn't recreate it, but he published a paper. And some other people are like, yeah, I got N-rays. And they started publishing papers. But there's some skeptics. One of them named Robert Wood decided he was going to check it out. So he goes to France. And he says, all right, show me the N-rays. So they go, OK. And they get the lights out. And they put the prism in the machine. And, and they start recording data. And he's like, you know, I'm not seeing it. So what does he do? When the lights are out, and without telling anyone, he removes a prism from the machine, disabling it. And he says, all right, still see the N-rays? Yeah, still looks the same. So in five seconds, you just debunk that whole thing. You, know, you want to be like Robert Wood. Um, unfortunately, science doesn't really have like, like an instruction manual, step by step, where you can become a great scientific thinker. Um, but here's four good tips, OK? Look for explanations in the world. Be curious. Ask a lot of questions. Um, try to make sense out of things, right? Second one is be falsifiable. So that's kind of a weird one. Um, but you don't want to be like the guy in Carl Sagan's book who uh, has an invisible dragon. He says, I got a dragon in my garage. And you go, great, I want to see that. And you go and you go to his garage, and it looks empty. And he's like, well, it's an invisible dragon. And you're like, OK, can I put flour on the floor and see his footprints? No, no, it's a hovering invisible dragon. <laughs> you're like, OK, can I get an infrared detector? Maybe I could see the, the fire? No, it blows cold fire. Yeah, you don't want to be the invisible dragon people, right? If you have an idea that you can't falsify, that's not a, that's not a strength. It's a weakness. Uh, third thing, design and conduct experiments. So this takes a little bit. Um, Humility, right? Because this might not pan out. You know, the world is a complicated place. Um, Einstein has a great quote. He says, um, all of science, when compared with reality, or measured against reality, is childlike and primitive. But it's the most precious thing that we have. So it's OK to be wrong. Run your experiments. Test your stuff. Okay? And then the last one, be willing to change your mind. OK, this is big. And if you have any doubts that um, you have an invisible dragon that you're believing in, ask yourself, what evidence, if it were produced, would convince me to change my mind? Right? And if you can't answer that question, I hate to break it to you, you're probably not really thinking like a scientist. You're probably holding on to that invisible dragon. All right, so how does this stuff apply to your data science work? OK, it helps you. Interpret data, because data doesn't speak for itself. Up isn't always up. Um, it helps you evaluate evidence. So you get like a statistical spidey sense. When somebody's showing you something, you start thinking, maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. right? 
Maybe they're showing me the hits and hiding the misses. Third thing is uh, features. So you're putting features into a predictive model, and you're trying to figure out what makes sense. A lot of people think you could just take all of them, just plow through them, and I'll just keep testing on fresh data. Eventually, all the false positives get out. That's true, but the, that's not the problem. The problem is the false negatives. You get too much nonsense into your models, they crowd out the real variables, and you'll throw out the wrong ones. Right? And finally, running experiments whenever possible. The strongest evidence that you can produce is evidence that could have gone against you. So I'll give you a very specific example of scientific thinking, okay? This is called the Wasson Selection Task. And on each of these four cards, there's a letter on one side and there's a number on the other. And you're given a rule that you're supposed to test, okay? And the rule is, if there's a vowel on one side, it has an even number on the other side. And then the question is, which cards do you have to flip over to see if the rule's true or false, okay? So most people, okay, you flip over the A, right? That makes sense. You want to see if it's an even number on the back. But only 4% of the test takers got this right. 4%. So you're all thinking, so it's not the four card. Yeah, it's a seven card is the only one that can break the rule. So as a scientist, you want to you falsify the rule, okay? Now, consider this version. Same question, okay? But this time, it's a bar, and you got four people at the bar. One side of the card is what drink they have, and the other side of the card is their age. And you're saying the rule to, to test is if they're drinking a beer, they have to be over 21 years old. All of a sudden, it's a lot easier, right? It's the same question. 72% of the test takers got this one right, even though it's the same question. They go, oh, yeah, you check the beer drinker, see if he's underage, and you check the underage person to see if they're drinking a beer, right? This gives me hope. This makes me really optimistic about the idea that this isn't an intelligence test. This isn't a logic puzzle. This is a mindset, right? It's a scientific mindset. You can actually teach people this, right? So a lot of people have invisible dragons, but I think the grand champion of invisible dragons are the flat earthers, right? Here's, a piece of exa here's an example of evidence that they present to show that the earth is flat, okay? Here's a picture of the Chicago skyline from 60 miles away. And they say, all right, do the math round, earthers. That should be below the horizon. And they're right. Um, by the way, it's like, isn't it interesting how pseudoscientists, they kind of treat science like it's a house of cards, right? They look for the one fact or the one study that doesn't quite hold up, and they think the whole thing's going to come crashing down. You can ignore all the other evidence, right? I'm, I'm more of like, science is more like a jigsaw puzzle, okay? All the pieces fit together, and even if you remove some of the pieces, you'll still be able to see the big picture, okay? So not surprisingly, scientists have an explanation for this. They say it's uh, atmospheric refraction, or looming. Um, so that is, they're kind of counting on the fact that you don't know quantum electrodynamics, right? The light is a very weird thing. It can travel in all kinds of different paths, and even curved paths, depending on the temperature. So cold air is denser than hot air. And light always finds the quickest path. So it actually curves up and around and makes it look like the city is higher than it is. Okay, kind of crazy, like you don't really know that. But it's actually the exact same thing pretty much that happens with mirages. But in that case, the hot air is on the ground and the light goes down there and then goes really fast to your eye. And so that gives the illusion that you're seeing cars in the sky. So, so it's the same thing. So scientists are like, yeah, that's the explanation. Okay, so how do you know who to believe, right? Well, scientists don't do the invisible dragon thing. They say, well, you know, we're saying it's due to the different temperature. So if you take the exact same picture from the exact same position, you're going to see different stuff. You're going to see the, the skyline drop below the horizon. And sure enough, that's what you see. So at different days, you see it, that's consistent with the scientists. Um, now, there's a saying that... Uh, you can't reason somebody out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. So don't expect any flat earthers to change their minds when they see this talk, right? Um, in fact, you don't see a lot of anybody changing their mind, except for these guys. These guys change their minds all the time. Scientists change their minds constantly. Even this guy. Now, you might not have gotten 
that impression from your textbooks growing up because they kind of just show you discoveries like they come out of the blue, right? We got to change that, you know? We got to teach students about the struggles, the questions, the, the debates that led to the discoveries. And not just because that's how data science actually works or how science actually works, uh, but, but that's how you draw students into the subject. I mean, for example, Einstein here is one of the founders of quantum theory. Um, but it was like he had opened Pandora's box. I mean, he was at his wit's end trying to make sense out of the stuff that was coming out of this crazy theory. And the debates between him and Niels Bohr, reading about those things, that's what got me interested in physics. You know, in fact, those debates, uh, believe it or not, they led to the series of experiments that won the Nobel Prize in Physics this year that established quantum entanglement, you know. And if Einstein were alive today, he would have changed his mind about what he called spooky action at a distance, you know. That's a thing. So here's Richard Feynman. Love this guy, everything he says. Uh, he, uh, he's talking about what kind of an ideal science course would be like. And he mentions questions, right? So questions are underrated. Sometimes a good question can just lead you to the answer, right? The funniest example of this uh, is I read about this guy who's a college student, and he couldn't believe how many people around him didn't know there was gravity on the moon. And so he decided to make a questionnaire. And he's like, okay, you know, first question's like, is there gravity on the moon? And like half the people got it wrong. And, uh, but he had a second question. And the second question was, okay, if there's no gravity on the moon, how come astronauts walking on the moon don't float away? Good question, right? After reading that, half of the people went back and changed their answer to the first question. Um, good response. You want to be one of those guys. Change your mind. Unfortunately, like 20% of the test takers just doubled down on nonsense, and they actually wrote in their reason why astronauts don't float off the moon. Heavy boots, <laughs> right? Like, that makes sense. Yeah, you don't want to be the heavy boots people. You want to be Richard Feynman. You want to be the guy taking the prism out of the machine. Or at the very least, you want to be like my cousin Vinny. You guys seen this movie? It's a great movie. He's this attorney. Um, his first case, unfortunately for him, is trying to get his cousin and his friend off of uh, murder charges that they're innocent of. But the problem is it, he like failed the bar exam five times. You know, he keeps getting thrown in jail for contempt of court because he doesn't know basic courtroom procedure and stuff like that. But he has a talent. This guy has a skill, and that is finding the right questions to ask. And it's and it's really fun to see and amazing to see how far just that one skill gets him. And in this scene, he's talking about the, uh, the uh, attorneys presenting the case against him. They're based on uh, bricks of evidence. And he's saying, if you look at the evidence from the right angle, they're as thin as this playing card. And he's really good at looking at things from the right angle. And I, as I was getting ready for this talk, I was thinking about my cousin Vinny for some reason. I'm like, why am I thinking about him? And I realized it, I kind of relate to this because um, when I, I'm kind of like a My Cousin Vinny of data science. Because <laughs> when I interviewed for my job, um, I didn't know Python, I didn't know R, I didn't know what a GitHub repo is. I'm doing all my stats in Excel, you know. But I brought my evidence of the poker system that you mentioned, uh, you know. And they were interested in that. Um, and the funny thing is I was pretty terrible at poker. It was, but it was a, it was a childlike and primitive uh, a strategy that was profitable. And, and the, but the interviewer just goes, this is perfect. Like, this is exactly what we want, like, in analytics. Um, so I don't know if, that, if the poker got me the job. I also had a friend who worked there, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but it helped, you know. Um, and yeah, so my friend knows what I'm like. And what I'm like is that. Uh, you know, I had several people growing up, they call me Spock. You know, I grew up watching all the episodes of Cosmos and stuff like that, kind of a science nerd. And then by the time I was a teenager, um, I feel, uh, you know, I started learning the value of statistical evidence. And I feel sorry for this card shop owner still. He, he decided to pick a fight with me literally hours after I had finished like this five page research paper concluding that Michael Jordan is a better basketball player than Magic Johnson. 
you know. And he picked this time to get in an argument with me. Um, so basically, you know, what I was lacking in the technical skills, I actually had in the scientific and the statistical reasoning skills. And it came in handy right away. Like, a friend of mine was being taught how they do the stats for A-B tests. I said, hey, can I listen in? Sure. And so I'm listening to how they're doing the statistics at my job, and, and something just wasn't right. I was like, hey, how are you getting the uncertainty here? You know, it just didn't seem right. And so I, t I took it back to my cube, and I started playing around with it, making little toy examples. And I came up with this example. And if they're testing two different websites, and like this is the clicks, the way they were doing the stats, layout two wins, and it's, a, it's statistically significant even though it lost all the days except for one great day, you know. So somebody could have, you know, just a bot or something went crazy. And so I'm looking at this and, you know, in my mind, when you have volatility like that, that makes you less certain, not more certain, right? You should go, well, well I'm not so sure about the results anymore. But the way that they had the stats, it just kept getting, the air bars just kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And um, so I brought this up to my manager, who's fantastic. He's like a, a mentor. And he's told me, oh, yeah, you got to take this up to upper management. You got to talk to them about this. And they were really interested because they're like, you know, we've had a lot of false positives in our tests and we don't know what's going on. Next thing you know, I'm redesigning their statistics and I'm managing their testing pipeline. You know, so when you guys get your job and they show you how they're doing stuff, don't just assume everybody knows what they're doing, right? Try to break it, try to falsify it, right? And then, you know, until you're comfortable and it makes sense to you. Um, now, we would have just loved to run tests all day, uh, but unfortunately, the number one question we get in the analytics is always, why is revenue down? Okay. And one day, the president came into our area and she was mad. And she's like, I was in a boardroom and the finance guys put out this chart showing that revenue is down and I got blindsided. I had no idea. How come you guys didn't tell me about this? And we're like, Revenue is not down, it's flat. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. She goes, that's it. We're getting you guys, we're going to have a meeting, we're going to get analytics, we're going to get finance together, we're going to get to the bottom of this, okay? So we go into the boardroom. She goes, all right, finance, put up the chart that you, you showed at the board meeting. And they put it up, and it looks something like that. And analytics, we just start laughing. We're like, what's so funny? We're like, well, I mean, look at the y-axis. It doesn't go to zero. Like, it's like you're, like, zoomed up on it, you know? And so she goes, okay, finance, like, you know, rescale the chart, put zero on there. And he puts it up there, and that's what it looks like. <laughs> I mean, this is real. Like, this happened. Like, these are smart people, right? And so I kind of hate to break it to you data science students out there. You're working on your random forests. You're working on your neural nets, right? You think that uh, you're going to go in the corporate world. You're going to work on, you're going to be dealing with AI, right? No, you're going to be dealing with BS. <laughs> Okay, and, and what I'm saying is you need to get good at this stuff because this will make you valuable in the workplace. Okay, here's another example. We tested four different colors. They're all statistically equivalent. Okay, great. We give it a shot, right? Move on. No, the manager says, well, what about by country? You know, maybe different countries like different colors. And I could already see where this is going. Sure enough, the analyst digs into the data. England loves teal. Okay, teal is a significantly better in England. He's like, great, all right, let's, let's roll. And I'm like, stop, stop. There's so many different colors and country combinations. You know this is not going to be anything. Just take my word for it. Just wait, like, run the test for another week or two. If teal's still winning in England, you can roll it out. You'll have my blessing. See, I'm falsifiable, right? So I'm like, oh, fine. So I ran the test, and sure enough, in the next two weeks, you know, teal did significantly worse in England. You know, statistical significance is not actual significance, okay? So when you think about, like, what a p-value represents, it's just, you know, what's the likelihood that you're going to see the evidence you're looking at um, in a world of chance, right? So if you have a p-value of 5% and you're running 20 tests, what do you think is going to happen, right? Even if there's nothing there. And by the way, I can't show this meme and not also show this meme. Morpheus never said, what if I told you in the matrix? I was, mind was blown when I heard that. <laughs> so a couple years later, I'm at Berkeley. I'm in the Master of Information of Data Science program. 
and we had a course, and, and we had a course where we had to predict uh, the likelihood that people are going to return to a hospital after they're discharged. Okay, it was a Chicago hospital, so we had all kinds of medical tests and things like that. And we thought we had this real winner. We got a 0.96 correlation between blood pH and readmission percentage. Okay, now. A clown would call it a day and just throw it in the model and say up is up and the data speaks for itself and all that stuff, right? But we weren't clowns. So we said we should run this by a doctor. We should make sure this makes sense. And it's a good thing we did because he looked at this and he goes, it's weird, the relationship's backwards. Like if you have a low blood pH, you're dead. <laughs> and we're looking at it like, what did we do wrong? And then we're like, oh, we forgot to remove the dead patients from the data set. <laughs> so what this model was telling us is that if you are, you are unlikely to be readmitted to the hospital if you are discharged to the mortuary, <laughs> right? I mean, the data was speaking for itself, but it was talking about something else, right? Um, so sure enough, we removed the dead patients, and then it, the correlation reversed, <laughs> just like the doctor said. All right, so I'm going to spend some time on this one, okay? Because this is the most common statistical pitfall and the, mo the least understood, okay? Regression toward the mean is everywhere, okay? Why are athletes and teams on the cover of Sports Illustrated, why do they tend to do worse afterwards? Are they jinxed? Kind of, but it's not to do with the cover. It's that in order to get on the cover of the magazine, you have to overperform, right? You have to have a real good rush, and you probably had some luck. And there's a Swedish proverb that says, luck doesn't give, it only lends. So your luck is probably going to run out, okay? This is everywhere. Here's what it looks like. So if you were to take, for example, the top 10 baseball batting averages in any given month, and you say, take those t same 10 players, and you look at them the month before and the month after, this is what it looks like. Makes sense, right? I mean, they can't be in the top 10 all the time, so, you know, that makes sense. But when you turn it into like a prediction problem, and you say, hey, I got a list of baseball players, and on average, they're gonna do worse next month. People look at you weird, right? And especially if they look at the stats, they go, these guys are on an upward trend, man. I'll take that bet. Do that every month. Take all their money, and maybe they'll name a jinx after you, <laughs> right? So we ran into this at work. So people collect domain names. Some of them do better than others, of course. So they have the underperforming names. They say, hey, analytics, can you work on these? Can you get the revenue up? Sure. So I give them to my friend. He optimizes them. He puts in keywords and stuff like that. And every single time, the next day, the revenue went up 20%. You're like, this guy is amazing. You should do this full time. This is incredible success, right? But the scientist in me is saying, you know, technically, he should be doing a random half should be testing, tweaking this random half and comparing it to this half to see if it's really working. And they were like mocking me, like, what? You know, revenue's up 20%. You don't know if it's working or not. You know, up is up. And sure enough, one day he forgot. And the revenue went up 20% the next day. So they came to his desk, hey, great job. He's like, I didn't get around to it yet. I'm like, well, whatever you did worked. Yeah, it's like the heavy boots, isn't it? Um, yeah, so you got to have a control. This is regression to me. It's the opposite of the Sports Illustrated. Instead of like the best athletes being on the cover of the magazine and they're destined to do worse, these were the worst domain names being given analytics and they're destined to do better. Why is there a sophomore slump? You're looking at the best freshmen usually, right? There's your answer. Why are movie sequels usually worse than the originals? So if you've been paying attention, you know the answer to this one. If you want the sequels better than the originals, make a sequel to the worst movies. Why does punishment seem to work better than reward? Well, if somebody does something incredibly good and you give them a reward, they tend to do worse. If somebody does something horrible and you punish them, they tend to do better. I mean, that's exactly what would happen if you didn't do anything at all. So Daniel Kahneman has a good quote. That regression toward the mean punishes you for rewarding people and rewards you for punishing people. A study showed the kids who underperformed on the SAT did better the next time when you give them a drug to relax them called propanolol. 
So hopefully, you guys are starting to get a statistical spidey sense, right? I started to tingle when I said they underperformed on the SAT. What do you think is going to happen when they take the test again, right? And while we're here, let me blow your mind with this one. I'm willing to bet that most of what they call the uh, placebo effect is just regression toward the mean messing with you. Consider this example. Suppose you're going to run this test and you do it the right way, okay? You got the people, they underperformed on the SATs, randomly divide them up into half. You give half of them the drug, half of them a sugar pill, right? And what happens? Both groups do better. The power of the human mind, right? No, it's just regression toward the mean. They were, they were going to do better no matter what. If you want to test the placebo, have a third group. Don't do anything at all. And so then you see if the placebo pill is better than the group that you didn't touch. Okay? One last example. So in New York, they said, hey, if we crack down on the little stuff, then we can reduce violent crime. And they tried it out. And in the precincts that they tested it on, the violent crime went down 56%. Fantastic success, right? Oh, minor detail, they tested it on the most violent precincts. So of course, a study came out that controlled for the level of violent crime, and it turned out they were actually making things worse. Regression toward the mean, hopefully you agree with me, this is like mandatory in any statistics class. This is everywhere, it's very important. Another thing I think you gotta cover in your stats class is the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. So there's a couple different versions of this one. So one of them, there's a barn wall, and I just shoot at it. There's a bunch of targets everywhere, and I just shoot at it blindly. And then I go and I erase all the targets that I missed. Looks like I'm a great shot, right? So that's like the publication bias. You just hide the evidence of failures. Yeah? This one, there's no targets at all. You just, shoot the wall, you just shoot the barn wall, and then you go paint the targets around the bullet holes, right? So that's called harking. Hypothesis after the results are known, okay? And that's like England loves teal, right? We had the test, we weren't testing colors in countries. We just kind of came up with that when we found a statistically significant result. And I think there should be a third one, which is there's only one target, and it's there ahead of time, but you just keep shooting at it until you hit it. And then you erase all the bullet holes it missed, okay? And that's p-hacking, okay? Funniest example of p-hacking. The dead fish study. So literally, the scientists, they go to the grocery store, they get a dead salmon, they slap that thing in the fMRI, they show it photographs, and then they tell the salmon, determine what emotion the individual in the photo must have been experiencing, and there's brain activity. And a cra the crazy thing about this study is they did everything right except for not controlling for the many comparisons problem which like a third of the papers were also doing at the time. So this really shined a spotlight on the problem of basically p-hacking within uh, fMRI results. So that's p-hacking. This is publication bias, okay? You heard about Paul the octopus correctly predicting all the soccer matches. So your first question should be, how many other animals are out there watching sports and making predictions? Right? We're not hearing about those because they probably didn't do as well. Okay? So I'm not saying math doesn't matter with all this statistical stuff. I actually like p-values. I think they're great. You just have to be careful when you're interpreting them. Right? And sometimes math will just give you the answer that you're looking for. There's a great story in this book, fantastic book by the way, um, where the author's son was a little underweight and so he took it uh, he took his son to the doctor and they say, okay, we're gonna test him for celiac disease. And so they gave him two blood tests. One of them came back positive, one came back negative, okay? The doctor said, well, the one that came back positive has 80% accuracy, so that's a pretty strong diagnosis. We're gonna mess with his diet and do some stuff, right? But the dad is the data guy, and he's like, well, let me look at this thing. I'm gonna do some research. And he looks into the test. He finds out the 80% accuracy was actually a reference to the 20% false negative rate of the test. The false positive rate was 50%. So even if you don't have celiac, half the time it's going to say you do. And the other test that came back negative was the more accurate test. So he plugged this into his Bayes theorem, estimated that his son had a one in a thousand chance of celiac disease based on these test results. So he goes back to the doctor 
shows it to him. And you'd think the doctor would be like, oh, my bad, I'm bad at math or whatever. But no, the doctor's like, yeah, it can be very hard to hear a diagnosis like this. It's like another heavy boots guy. Yeah, so this gives me to the one downside of the scientific mindset. Once you get the scientific reasoning down, you're going to find yourself really annoyed by all the nonsense that's out there and the things that people believe in. You know, this bugged the heck out of me. You go there, oh yeah, my Starbucks is going to give me cancer. How did they figure that out, right? This, <laughs> this goes back to the IARC. They do some tests. They don't think about dosage, and they're looking at, you know, uh, you know, tests that don't can, you know, take care of all the confounding variables and stuff like that. This drives me crazy because it, it reduces people's confidence in science, you know. You get a study out and it's a, it's a super clinical trial with a vaccine. You're, okay, here's this thing and you, you, people don't believe it because they're like, well, you know, the coffee, you know, scientists don't know what they're talking about, you know. People look at this, they don't know the difference between uh, a study that has a random control and all this kind of stuff. Um, there's actually one guy who tried to do this the real way. In Sweden, King Gustav III, he had identical twins on death row. And he says, I'm going to switch them to life in prison on the condition. One of them gets three pots of tea a day and one of them gets three pots of coffee. Right? Talk about controlling variables. They're identical twins. They got them in cages and they're feeding them the same exact food. Right? And he thought coffee was toxic and this guy's going to die pretty soon. Um, but it turns out both of them lived until they were in their 80s. You know, they outlived the king who was assassinated. Um, and, uh, you know, the guy who drank coffee lived a little bit longer. But this is kind of crazy stuff. If you really wanted to convince me that coffee is toxic, you know, this is the kind of thing you'd have to do, you know. Um, it's crazy. And here's another one. I, the IARC also said, you know, cell phone radiation could possibly be carcinogenic to humans. So before you even get into like the studies, just I, I want you guys to ask a couple of questions. First question, how? Okay. And if you talk to a physicist, they'll tell you, okay, electromagnetic radiation, you have higher frequency means higher energy. And there's a difference between ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. Okay. Ionizing radiation can knock electrons out of orbits, cause mutations in DNA. That's what causes cancer. Okay. So, and the higher the energy, the higher the frequency, the higher energy, and it can penetrate deeper into your body, right? So at the low end of ionizing radiation is ultraviolet. Can't penetrate the skin. So that's why you get skin cancer, okay? X-rays is higher, so it can go deeper into your body. Gamma rays turns you into the Incredible Hulk, <laughs> right? There is no known mechanism by which non-ionizing radiation can cause cancer. So right off the bat, you hear this, this claim, the causal mechanism is magic, okay? So that's one strike. The second thing I want you to ask, Suppose this is true. What would the world look like? I mean, there's a lot of cell phones out there, right? Is there going to be like a spike in brain cancer or something? Yeah, not so much, right? Now, fortunately, uh, the FDA, they listed both of these facts. And uh, when they determined that cell phone radiation is not a cancer risk. So there are critical thinkers out there. I want you guys to be one of them. So if any of you came a couple years ago, uh, Dr. Gary Smith from Pomona gave a talk. And you might recognize this stop sign that he put a sticker on and a neural net falsely identified it as a first aid kit. Okay? This is a problem researchers have had. You know, in machine learning, it's very brittle, right? So they have these object classifiers. and They can't figure out why stupid little changes to an image mess up the classifier you know, when anybody can look at that and know what it is. And his major point in his talk was that computers don't have any critical thinking. Okay? My continuation to that is to say, therefore, you want to be good at critical thinking, right? Because I don't know what jobs are going to be in 10 years, but you probably don't want to get really good at stuff that computers can do. Right? You don't want to be, like, really great at the thing that they click the button and they can replace you. Right? So critical thinking, scientific mindset are important. You don't want to be a machine. Um, so now I'm going to blow your minds again. I'm going to tell you something I haven't read about anywhere. I haven't heard anywhere. This is a crazy idea. And I want you to tell me, or at least think about, whether or not this is an invisible dragon. Okay? 
Here's my crazy idea. The subconscious mind is brittle like the neural nets in object classification. Where would I get this crazy idea, right? So my daughter, Jacqueline, who goes to Pomona, don't hold it against her, um, she has a rare hereditary perceptual condition called synesthesia. And it basically mixes your senses, okay? So let's just say she has a colorful life, all right? She sees colors for letters, numbers, foreign characters, even uh, music, okay? Anyways, about a year ago, she started playing online chess, and the pieces started to get colors. So for example, the rook is dark green, the, the pawns are light red, uh, bishops are yellow. You with me so far? I took a real world bishop and I showed it to her and she said it looks like this. When you turn it so that the little slash in the hat is in the back, it loses its color. It's like, because that's an unconscious subconscious mind thing, right? Classifying this as a bishop, all of a sudden her subconscious mind said, no, it's not a bishop anymore. It's just like those neural nets, right? Because her, in, in machine learning terms, her training set, her training data, was a digital bishop. It always has the line on the side of it. That's bishops. So as soon as you hide that feature, obviously she knows it's still a bishop, but the color is gone, right? So is that an invisible dragon? I don't think so, because any neuroscientists in here? Throw her in an fMRI machine, start throwing, showing her some bishops and see what lights up, right? Just don't forget about the whole many comparisons problem from the dead fish, okay? All right, so we're out of time, but I'm gonna, here's the nine pitfalls of data science. And I want you, as you look down the list, to notice something they all have in common. And that is, you can't automate your way around this stuff, okay? This is like job security for data scientists, okay? The, more, the less mindless, the better, you know? So if you want to avoid the pitfalls of data science, you want to follow the path of scientists, you want to be critical thinkers, because data doesn't speak for itself. Up isn't always up. You want to be skeptics, because anybody can torture data and make it look like it, it agrees with them. And you want to be experimenters, because the strongest evidence out there is evidence that could have gone against you. So please, put the science in data science and be scientists. Thank you. much for the wonderful talk. We are now going to move on to the Q&A portion of the event. Um, so please come to either mic, ask your question. We're going to alternate between the two. Make sure to ask only one question and please be brief. When you come up, make sure to introduce yourself, say your name, your class, as well as your major. Thank you, Professor, for the talk. I have a rather provocative question. Okay. If it's so uh, important to have critical thinking in data science, why is middle school education at least misses that point completely and teaches people, urges people to be correct all the time? Thank you. Yeah, that's, it's, it's um, a provocative question. I <laughs> said that in the beginning. So, so, so say it again. I just want to make sure I get it right. So you're yeah. saying because so, teachers are just forcing people to get the right answer, and they're not, they're not kind of getting kids to ask questions and things like that. So there's an interesting blog article by um, Professor Gary Smith about a week ago, and, and it's, it's interesting because he says that the development of AI is actually might force people to become better educators in kind of in lines with what I'm proposing. And the reason is because AI is getting so good now with faking answers that students are getting really good at cheating. So kind of to your answer, the AI can spit out the facts. You know what I mean? It can just find patterns somewhere. It can, it can just throw out the answers and that doesn't require any critical thinking at all from the students. And, and it's funny because his point is, so that actually be a good thing because the unexpected consequence of that is that the teachers are going to have to modify the questions that they ask to 
not be easy for a computer system to just kind of figure out the answer by some pattern matching thing. It has to require a little bit of problem solving, a little bit of critical thinking. And so um, I actually think it's, it's interesting how technology might force people to be better educators and uh, not just look for just facts. Pretty interesting. Good question. Hello, I'm Abe, uh, senior at CMC. So I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the idea of fooling yourself. Um, as someone who's currently finishing up his thesis, God, I'm glad today's not Friday. Um, I was wondering, like, the idea that making conclusions from data when those when that data exact might be misleading. I was wondering, conversely, like, how do you know when you might be I guess I'd say like too hard on yourself when you're like not drawing enough conclusions from data, if that makes sense at all. <laughs> Interesting. So you're saying that you're like afraid to be wrong. Is that what you're saying? Like you're, you, you're, yeah, you're, pretty getting, much. you're getting risk averse. Exactly. Yeah, I think, I think that has to do with people have to get over, um, they have to define success in a little bit different way. Because I feel like if you do a project and you test something and it turns out not to be true, that could be very useful, you know what I mean? So if you have an interesting idea that you want to test, just do it rigorously and just be your worst critic and, and make, see, make sure you're not fooling yourself because you're not, you know, I think a lot of times people are just kind of pushing even subconsciously like, I want to get a result here, you know, I want to get the, I want it to be true, you know, and that's where you just walk into, you know, face palm kind of situations, you know, and um, so I feel like if you have a rigorously designed and conducted experiment that comes back totally negative, like, okay, I was way off. But that's a great study, you know. And that could be very useful, especially if it's something that people think is true, right? Do a study to, to debunk a placebo effect or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, whoa, I, we've been hearing this for decades, you know. Then uh, that would be a fantastic to get a negative result, you know. Thanks. That's really encouraging. <laughs> I'd like to hear about your poker model that was crude but successful. I want to hear about yeah, this. Yeah, my childlike and primitive poker system. Yeah, so I was watching um, the World Poker Tour. So I was a backgammon player, actually. I was a tournament backgammon player. Um, and I also loved chess. But you can't find that stuff on TV. The only thing on TV was poker. So I'm like, OK, I want to learn how to play poker so I can appreciate these strategies, right? And so I was watching World Poker Tour, and they had this poker corner. And it, and it gave advice, and it said, when you have a short stack, you have only one move, all in, OK? And a little sad face, like that's a bad thing, right? But from a game theory point of view, like, wait a minute, you're telling me that your short stack, you, you have one choice, all in or not, all in or fold. That seems like a tractable problem. And there, I couldn't think any reason why being a short stack was necessarily a bad thing, you know, in terms of like return on investment. And there were a lot of sites that allow you to buy in as a short stack. So I'm like, let's try this out. Like, so I just, I just went to the tiniest little tables, you know, and just try it out. Let's say, what if I go all in 10% of the time? Let's get the top 10% hands. And so I just start going in and collecting data. Because you're playing online, you can get hand history, right? So you download the data, you could crunch the numbers, and you could see, like, OK, what percentage of the time are people folding? What percentage of the time are they calling? And if they do call, how do your hand match up? What's, what's your calling equity when they call you? What's your folding equity when they don't call you? What's the blind equity? What's the cost of sitting at the table and waiting for a good hand? And I just had a little spreadsheet, just crunching the numbers. And I go, oh, man, look at that. You should go all in. According to this data, you should, should, you should go all in 20% of the time. So if you buy in for 10 times the big blind, every fifth hand should be going all in. And it turned out that was the maximally exploitive strategy for the tables that I was playing at. And it was so simple, you just memorized the strategy. It's a 3, 7, 8, 10, 10, jack. Those are the kickers that you have, depending on ace suited, king suited, queen suited, or whatever. Pair of fives. OK, got my strategy. It's so simple, you could play a bunch of tables at a time. You know? And, and uh, my wife's friend, he's like, oh, you got to teach me this poker system. And uh, so I show it to him. And, uh, He's like, okay, I got it. I'm going to make a bunch of money. And so he goes home, and he calls us up. Um, yeah, so we were playing, like, I think it was $10 big, $10 big blind or something. 
maybe it was no one dollar big blind. He was just going in for like ten bucks. It was like little stakes, right? And he goes home. He calls us back an hour later. He goes, "I'm taking you guys out to a steak dinner. I'm up a thousand dollars." Like, what? That's not possible. How are you a thousand dollars? And then I realized, oh, he was playing at ten times the stakes that he was supposed to. Like, whoa, back up, man. And so he just got lucky that, that he made money that fast. Um, but yeah, so he shared this strategy with people. You know, the best people, uh, best friend that, uh, but he was kind of ADHD. He actually played like 12 tables at a time. You know, it's like, you know, I'd stress out if I was doing that. Um, but it was a data-driven strategy, and it was just a lot of fun sharing it with friends. Um, the, best, the best return investment guy was like an actuary. He's like, I don't like gambling, you know. And I'm, he's really risk averse. I'm like, you're perfect. You know, <laughs> just follow the thing. You know, just follow the system. And it worked great. Uh, hi. Thank, oh, uh, hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my name's Henry Long. I'm a sophomore here at CMC studying uh, philosophy, politics, and economics, as well as data science. Nice. Uh, do you think that the, the weakness of so many data science majors coming out of college is due to a lack of kind of respect for science, or do you think it's a lack of respect for kind of like critical thinking, and do you think that could be mitigated by more focus on like a humanities or other critical thinking major? Yeah, I don't even know if it's lack of respect. It's that they weren't exposed to it. I think there's so much technical stuff in data science. You just get bogged down. It's like, oh my gosh, I gotta learn Python. I gotta learn this. I gotta learn. There's so much that you're just like, I gotta get through this checklist of, of statistics and programming. And it's like, where's the room for the sciencey stuff? You know what I mean? Um, I just feel like the the average person doesn't know that it matters, right? And so I feel like maybe the data science, we, we haven't figured this out yet. We're gonna work on this website. We're gonna have people kind of providing feedback and ideas, and we're gonna validate some of these ideas. Um, it just seems like too many people are just automatic. They're just on autopilot. And, and, and I think you need to develop it in a problem-based learning environment where it's kind of like, okay, you're learning these specific techniques, but it's not because you want to know the technical stuff. It's because you want to solve this problem, you know, it, and it works for this thing, you know. And to have people interested in getting to the truth of it, you know, and maybe having them, some curveballs thrown in there to get people to fall into some of the pitfalls and they can kind of learn the hard way. Okay, this, is, this doesn't work if I just turn my brain off. I got to, like, think about this for a second. Thank you. Hi, my name is Desmond. We met at the table. Um, thanks so much for the great conversation there and for the talk. I did want to ask, you know, one of the key applications in data science right now has been questions about potentially eliminating money bail and replacing it with uh, pretrial detention systems that evaluate, you know, whether somebody is likely to reoffend or is, you know, likely to uh, be a danger to the community. I'm curious, you know, talk about doing harm as the ninth pitfall of data science. How do you avoid that in touchy issues like that? You say. Eliminating bail? Yeah, a money bail and replacing it with like a pretrial algorithm or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so the predictive algorithm is like the compass system. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, so compass got busted kind of, right? Because they, you know, they did some research on, they said, what's the likelihood of recidivism? What's the likelihood you're going to get arrested again? And uh, unfortunately for them, you know, it turns out that all the false positives for black people are like much higher than for white people. Um, they pretty much, it's unintentional. And like, it's really difficult because there's a lot of harm in data science that's intentional, you know, trying to get people not to vote based on they have all the kind of the same names and stuff like that. This one, I think they actually literally tried to avoid any kind of bias. And the problem is they think, you know, because you don't have any race in there that somehow it's going to be fair. Um, that one is a particularly tricky one, though, because in reality, people are getting arrested more, fairly or not, you know? And so the system is kind of like trained on an unfair world, and it's kind of perpetuating it. And so it's really hard to know how to, you know, mitigate damage from things like that, because it's, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it just starts perpetuating. I, I mean, 
I didn't even talk about the harm thing because I feel like that's a whole nother section. And unfortunately, it's not, it's not always clear what the data or the scientific approach is to deal with that. Um, you know, there's like the Belmont report talks about um, ethical experiments, you know, beneficence, respect, and justice. They have these kind of pillars that you can try to live up to. Um, you pretty much, it kind of comes out of the science world and into kind of society. You know, you got to come up with some ideas. I think the main thing is you got to be fair and you have to be transparent. Like the worst thing is when they have these black boxes, you know, and Compass, I think, is a perfect example where it's like, okay, we're going to put uh, like 200 variables in this thing and we don't really know how it works, you know, and they kind of protect themselves in a certain sense. But it's actually terrible because somebody at Dartmouth basically created an equally accurate system and all they looked at was the age of the person and how many prior arrests they had. That's it. And there was like 66% accuracy. And, and the compass system with like 100 variables with all this stuff that they probably shouldn't have been asking about, it was like 67%, you know. So just like cut that stuff out, be transparent, say here's the variables going into the system. We know that sometimes it's going to have some harm but it's like, but it might help shine a light on it, right? Because at least if it's transparent, you say, well, look, why are we arresting these guys more than these guys, you know? And let's, let's get to the bottom of the issue that started this whole thing, you know? And it's a tricky, it's a tricky question. Sorry, I don't, I don't have a great answer. Well, that was a very good answer. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm a CMC senior. Uh, thank you so much for coming to talk. My question, I guess, is whether you think these pitfalls apply differently to when you're thinking about causal inference problems as opposed to like prediction problems, like the one um, Desmond was talking about. And I guess like I'm coming from the perspective of someone who's been taught like the pedagogy here with like economics and social sciences have really emphasized, I guess, you know, like this is what we need for causation and like robustness in our methods. Um, and it seems like the problems that people come into um, when they have a more practical pedagogy with data science um, are kind of like where they're running into these problems. So I don't know, do you think there's a distinction there or? Yeah, so causality is a tough one. Um, I'm probably a little bit too far in the side of you gotta have a randomized experiment. Um, I know it's, I don't even know if in theory it's possible to get causality out of like observational studies. Epidemiologists work on this stuff and I just gotta say the track record is not great. I mean, I know that in theory you should be able to tease out causality and there's some, I wouldn't bet on it. I mean, if I saw anything, a new study coming out or something like that, um, I'm kind of like a, you know, you're never gonna think of everything, right? That's the problem. So when we're, and in fact, I gotta say, at work, we basically stopped looking at historical data altogether to look for revenue opportunities. We got so tired. We're not epidemiologists. We're, you know, we're always confounding variables we didn't think about. We run into Simpson's paradox and just all this crazy stuff. And at some point you're like, you know what? We're just gonna stick to the experiments because in the experiments, a visitor comes in, you get a little digital coin, randomize, you put them out, and you know that no matter what you forgot, your confounding variable is not going to be a problem because it can't be correlated with a random number, at least not for long, right? You just run the test long enough. Um, you know, so if you're digging into how do I get causality with outside of a randomized experiment, that's over my head. I mean, I, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. A randomized field experiment? Natural experiment? Natural experiments are great. Yeah, yeah sometimes like Walmart um, will start stocking their shelves with um, um, pop charts because a hurricane will come and then they, they go, oh, we need pop charts. And, that's just, and it's smart because what happens is the hurricane, it's like it selected one of their places. They can see that everybody buys pop charts. Oh, look, it kind of makes sense. You don't need electricity, you know, and it lasts forever and stuff like that. So sometimes nature takes the randomness for you and just kind of like zaps one store and gets special treatment. me and thanking our wonderful speaker for the incredibly insightful talk today. Thanks. 
I think we all came away better data scientists as well as poker players. Um, <laughs> and thank you all so much for coming to the app tonight. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great night.